you're here today. I am starting with announcements this morning and then we are taking turns and you'll see different people leading the service based on what they got chosen or selected to do. Also, if you've not seen it, uh, Hurricane Adelia, and I may not even say that right, did hit Advent Christian Village, hit them pretty hard. Um, they are getting electric restored. There's a lot of generator use going on. I know the Halls Road was blocked completely for a while. There is a link that you can go to to help um, the Advent Christian Village with their relief efforts. That has been sent out via email. It is on Facebook. If you need help finding it because you want to send something there, um, let me know. I'll help you figure it out and we'll get it to you in a way that works best. And I think those are my, my like priority announcements for the day. Are there any others that I should add today? And this is where Sam looks at me. So I'm gonna look at Charlene. <laughs> okay. Colossians 3, 12 through 14. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive whatever grievances you may have against one another. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all these virtues put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. If you will open up your hymnals, we do not have the uh, screen set up today. It's going to be hymn number 276, Praise Him, Praise Him. Hymn 276. towards us. I pray that you will prepare our hearts today, that we will be able to worship. I pray that you will prepare our hearts for the message, and that you will be with each and every one who is here today. In your name, amen. Um, 
Go ahead and flip over to page 262. We're going to sing Holy Ground, but only the chorus. 262. Seven, he is Lord. Peace, King, peace. 
else if I read the right words. <laughs> it's time for a prayer and praise requests, so Junior Church, you can go, and Jim Smith is leading it. Thank you for his work. Jim, I'm grateful for you. Matthew 19, 27 through 30. I almost read the wrong ones. Peter answered him, We have left everything to follow you. What then will there be for us? Jesus said to him, Truly I tell you, at the renewal of all things, when the Son of Man sits on his glorious throne, you who have followed me will also sit on twelve thrones, judging twelve tribes of Israel, the twelve tribes of Israel, and everyone who has left houses, or brothers, or sisters, or father, or mother, <coughs> or wife, or children, or fields for my sake, will receive a hundred times as much, and will inherit eternal life. But many who are first will be last, and many who are last will be first. I am reading Sam's sermon this morning. So he uses I and me, and um, I think for the sake of maybe not trying to adjust as I go, I'm going to read it I and me. And you will understand that it is his story, although from what I'm seeing of it, it sounds a whole lot like my story too. When I was young and growing up in my parents' home, my father, S. Hayden Walsh, was a minister a preacher. Preachers often drive many miles to visit people in hospitals, nursing homes, and to visit people in their homes. Dad regularly invited one of us three boys to go along on his visitation pastoral care. And because whatever Dad was doing was more interesting than what I was usually doing, I accepted his invitation. One time, we even made a house visit on bicycles when I was about 10 years old, and it was 20 miles round trip. Other visitations were not so interesting. Dad and the person would talk on and on about other things, things that were not important to me. He allowed me to bring a book to read after greetings, introductions, and such were completed. And whenever Dad got out the Bible, I put my book away and listened to Dad's reading and devotional, and I prayed with him and the person he was visiting. As I got older and became a teenager, such calls became less attractive. There was school and band and baseball and basketball at the church whenever we wanted. During the summertime, Dad would still ask me once in a while, and whether I said it out loud or not, I had the attitude, what's in it for me? What will I get out of going with you, Dad? If I did ask the question, I don't remember. He never answered me directly. His attitude was always, come and see. There was always something along the way that made me glad I went with Dad. Maybe an ice cream treat, Maybe a cup of cold sweet tea at someone's house. Maybe a driving lesson along the way. Or maybe the adventure of meeting someone really interesting, like the clockmaker with a house full of more than a hundred clocks that chimed and cuckooed all at the same time. What's in it for me? It was an impertinent, self-centered question. The opposite of the faith adventure being offered by Jesus, too. And yet, the Apostle Peter asked Jesus this basic question after the rich young man turned away from him. After the young man walked away from Jesus and salvation, Peter answered him, We have left everything to follow you. What then will there be for us? The question was an immature teenager type of thing to say to the King of Kings, Messiah, Savior of the world. But Jesus did not rebuke Peter or get exasperated or angry or argumentative with this question. See who the Savior Jesus is. 
He is so gracious and so, of, so full of truth that he answers. He came to us in our need, our doubts and fears, and accepts us and our questions. Just having Jesus might have been enough for some people, but not for Peter. Therefore, for those of us who are wondering if following Jesus is worth it all, Jesus answers the question, what is there for us? The first part of the answer is, I tell you the truth, or more literally, truly I say to you, assuredly I say to you. The first answer to see is that reward involves taking someone's word as the truth. When you buy a product because of its advertisement, you take the risk that it will live up to its promise. The car air conditioner will work after you take it to the garage. The food will be cooked correctly when I order a steak. The restaurant manager stakes his reputation on things being done right. Or we make financial investments in stocks or mutual funds based on their overall performance over time to make money. But there is no guarantee. But Jesus said, truly I say to you, Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. So when he says, truly I say to you, that's not, if everything happens to go right up there in Jerusalem, then I will save you. There is no disclaimer or shadow of doubt, no fine print. Jesus gave Peter assurance, truly I say to you, this is what we're going to get. Credibility is a big deal. Jesus backed up his life and rose from the dead to give you eternal life. His word is a credible source. It is backed up with his blood. So what I am saying plainly is, Jesus is trustworthy. He keeps his promises. He keeps his word. When I was questioning my dad, would it be worth it to go with him? I should have known that he had already settled the question in his mind that there would be value in going with him and I should have trusted his invitation. You may not be able to trust many people because people don't always keep promises and sometimes people will betray you. It happened to Jesus too, but you can always trust Jesus. You can trust him more than your own feelings or intuition. Jesus says, truly I say to you, there is no false advertising, no double talk, empty promises or We'll see with Jesus. Jesus says, truly I say to you. Now we need to get into the specifics of what Jesus promises. First, at the renewal of all things, when the Son of Man sits on his glorious throne, you who have followed me will also sit on 12 thrones, judging the 12 tribes of Israel. The first specific applies to the future and specifically to the 12 apostles except Judas. You will sit as I sit on a glorious throne, judging the 12 tribes. In context, remember that the rich young ruler in Luke 18 had walked away from Jesus to keep his riches and keep his earthly ruling. The apostles, in contrast, gave up their wealth and businesses to follow Jesus and ruled nothing in this present age. Jesus promised that a reverse would take place in the last day. At the renewal of all things is a promise of a new world, a regeneration of heaven and earth. It might appear that the rich young ruler keeps ruling in Israel, but at the last day, in the new world, things will be dramatically diff different. The last will be first, and many who are left. The last will be first, and many who are last will be first. I think that's a typo. I think it's the first will be last, and many who are last will be first. Feel free to check on me, that's in verse 30. Peter understood and learned these things, that there is hope for the future. Later on, with the Spirit's inspiration, he wrote in 2 Peter 3, 12 through 13, as you look forward to the day of God and speed its coming, that day will bring about the destruction of the heavens by fire and the elements will melt in the heat. But in keeping with his promise, we are looking forward to a new heaven 
and a new earth, the home of righteousness. Jesus will bring about a great reversal in the future. The second promise of Jesus applies to the present time. What will there be for us? Matthew 19, 29 says, And everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or children or fields for my sake will receive a hundred times as much. To the best of my understanding, I believe this verse is about security. Houses, brothers, family, fields guaranteed survival in tough times and re represented sources of income. Jesus is indicating that instead of a mathematical formula, a hundred times, it's more of an em emphasis that following Jesus and working for the spread of the gospel will be worth all the sacrifice we make. In this present age, following Jesus means sacrifice, but it will be worth it, even in this present age. In the kingdom of God, in the worldwide family of God, we gain more than a hundred times the amount of brothers and sisters around the world supporting us, praying for us, sharing with us. The Apostle Paul wrote, None of the rulers of this age understood it, for if they had, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. However, as it is written, No eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind has conceived what God has prepared for those who love him. That is 1 Corinthians 2, 8 through 9. Even in this present age, Jesus will surprise you with his blessings. The third answer to Peter's question, what will there be for us, synthesizes both present and future. Jesus said, and will inherit eternal life. And that is at the end of Matthew 19, 29. The wording of inheritance is important because Jesus contrasts the works, earning plan of the rich young ruler. What must I do to earn salvation? No. Salvation is a gift from God. You follow Jesus and you will become part of the family of God. And you are given the present assurance of an inheritance. You walk around now as an heir to eternal life. The Holy Spirit is that guarantee of the inheritance to come. But the future is when the gift of eternal life will be given. Not in this present age. You will inherit eternal life. Revelation 21, 3-4 gives us a glimpse of that future inheritance. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Now the throne of God is with men, and he will live with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. Your inheritance is secure for the future. Therefore, you can be bold today to follow Jesus. You could be, you can be an adventure Christian. Listen to the Lord. Follow the Spirit. Go to people who need Jesus because Jesus gives you assurance. It will be worth it all to trust him and to follow him in this present age and to inherit eternal life with Jesus forevermore. Jim, I'm gonna invite you back up. And while he is coming, our, oh, he's gonna stand there and pray, I'll be quiet. Go ahead.
Will you open up your hymnals? Um, we are going to sing hymn number 578, Seek Ye First the Kingdom of God. That's 578. scripture that tells us uh, what we what we need to know we remember from scripture that on the night that Jesus and his disciples were huddled together having their final meal together they broke bread and Jesus passed it around to the disciples symbolizing his broken body for each one of us and the privilege that we will have to live for him and what he will what he will do for us he said this is my body which is broken for you take and eat it and as often as you do remember me so now we take the body of our Lord Jesus Christ and we thank him for the way that he was so brutally beaten. We go to Isaiah and we read a scripture that tells us very clearly. When they got through flogging Jesus, he was not recognizable as a human being. It's pretty severe. But Jesus was also very clear on one other thing. Anyone who partakes of his body and his blood in an unworthy manner will be worse, will be guilty of a worse sin. So right now, let's pause for a second and, and, and just in a moment of silence with just each of us and with Jesus. Let's search our hearts and make sure that before we go through with this, that we are worthy to eat it with him. Let's just pause for a second.
And now, as we take the wafer, symbolizing the broken body of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, let us do this in remembrance of him. And in the same way as Jesus did when he distributed his broken body to the disciples. He took the cup, the third cup, the cup of redemption, and he passed it around, and each of the disciples drank of it. Drink this, all of you. This cup is the new covenant poured out for you and for many. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. As often as we do this, we have to do this in remembrance of Jesus. Are we worthy to drink the blood that he shed for our sins? That's a very serious question. A very serious question and it's one that we need to ask ourselves every morning when our eyes open am I worthy will I be worthy in an hour will I be worthy tonight it's it's it's, it's not a game but it is serious and so now as we take the cup let us all remember that this is, a, this is symbolic of Jesus' blood shed for us on the cross that we might live for him as he was willing to die for us. Let's drink. Our most gracious love, loving Heavenly Father, such a wonderful time to be in your house. It's such a wonderful time, dear God, to share with you in the service. It's a wonderful time, Lord, to be able to lead my brothers and sisters in communion, realizing that each of us do mentally uh, know the meaning of communion. And it's my prayer, dear God, that as we live out our lives until we're dead or you return, that we would be worthy. Thank you, and we pray these blessings in the precious and holy name of Jesus. Amen. Hymn number 375, The Family of God. On the bulletin it says 378. Don't listen to it, it's misprint. 375. Uh, though many of you know it, it's the family of God. Why don't you all stand for this one, too?